So uh, my name is Agnieszka Paseka. I'm a fellow at the Department of Social and Anthropology at the University of Vienna, and I'm a member of Redset. And it's uh, really an honor for me to be able to chair the session and to welcome Anna at, at the Redset premises. It's an honor because Anna has been such an inspiration to me as a scholar, as a thinker, but also as a person. And I think it's we are really privileged having you uh, with us uh, tonight. So a few, although you probably know a lot about Anna already, just a few words. She's a professor at Stanford University. Before coming to Stanford, she was a professor at Yale University, Michigan, and she held many other appointments, including, including the one at Harvard University. She is a member of the American Academy of Art and Sciences and recipient of many awards, including a very recently Guggenheim Award. She's the author of three books, who all, which also got multiple awards. The most recent one, and the one I think that got actually the, uh, was most acclaimed success, Nations Under God, the mo her most recent book. And her projects address many different subjects uh, from, as already mentioned, the relationship between religion and politics, global populism, and origins of the European state. That's one of her more recent uh, research projects. But my guess is that in today's talk, she will be returning a bit to her first uh, project, which dealt with the post-socialist transformation and the communist parties in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, and the problems which are of big importance for, uh, for Reddit. So Anna, thank you very much for accepting the invitation and the, the floor is yours. And we are looking forward to both the, the talk and the QAA afterwards. And maybe I'll just mention that you can Put the, for to those who don't know it yet, you can put the put the plus sign in the in the chat, and we will ask you to to uh, uh, to uh, to present your question, or you can also write your question if you prefer, or if your internet connection is not good enough. So once I, once again, thank you, and Anna, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for that incredibly kind and uh, characteristically generous uh, introduction, Aga. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I have some slides, so let me try and share my screen. This usually works. Uh, it does, yeah. <laughs> That's great, fantastic. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, the transformation and erosion of democracy in uh, basically East Central Europe. And what I want to talk about at the, the, during the conversation today is this path that the countries traveled from communist satellites to more or less consolidated democracies to now potentially eroding democracies. And so I'll be making three points about the democratic transformation and about the democratic erosion. And the irony here is that I'll argue that the same elite consensus that allowed democracy to be built then directly led to its current erosion. And we can think about this, you know, if, if Adam said that financial crises are like heart attacks, um, demo democratic erosion is more like diabetes. Um, it's gradual. It's reversible and it's inevitably fatal unless treated. So first, let's talk about the first, my first point about the democratic transformation. And this, of course, is the familiar story of 1989, um, the collapse of communism, the rejection of the Ancien Regime. It's a story of a return to Europe, um, the basically sort of, you know, the sort of myth of a return to a Europe that never was, and of the elite consensus that underlied it. So first. 1989 was very much a rejection of communism in East Central Europe. It certainly wasn't that in every place else. It certainly wasn't that in the Central Asian republics, but in the Baltics and in most of East Central Europe, this was a rejection of communism as a Soviet imperial project. So this is a resurrection of nations and the reassertion of sovereign state. At the same time, as I just mentioned, there's this nostalgia, the implicit comparison to what could have been had East Central Europe not been under the Soviet thumb. And the goal basically, that was often explicitly stated at the time, the goal is basically Sweden, a rich consolidated democracy that offered both political freedoms and rights and extensive social protections. That was the goal and both elite negotiations and societal mobilization centered around sort of, you know, this, this goal of freeing these countries from the Soviet imperial yoke and establishing this new order. And when this takes, you know, this, this was done through elite negotiations this is the famous Polish round table. The actual negotiations, of course, were held in various back rooms, but ever aware of the power of, of spectacle. Um, the sort of final meetings were held as this absolutely gorgeous um, hall and with the, uh, with the round table actually there. It also was done through mass mobilization, right? These are the citizens 
of these countries here in the um, former Czechoslovakia demanding basically their new rights. They're stirring images, not just of civil society arising, but of leaders across the generations and regimes calling for reform. So for example, you know, we have Václav Havel addressing the crowds, but we also have Václav Havel embracing Alexander Dubček, the leader of the 1968 um, so, you know, Prague Springs so of this vast reform effort within the Communist Party. And the message from the start is that of, you know, these are people who worked for different regimes, who worked for different um, parties, but who are now united in sort of, you know, bringing about greater sovereignty and moving these countries forward to a very different future. Of course, some of these images were less stirring than others. Um, this sometimes involved the heavy consumption of alcohol um, here, as with the representatives of Solidarity and the former Communist Party in Poland, celebrating the round table negotiations with yet another vodka toast. So that was sort of, you know, the, the sort of transform, part of the transformative project. Now, the return to Europe, as articulated by Havel, Michnik, Antal, and others, was not some kind of an ideological innovation, but a rejoining basically of these countries to sort of, you know, existing social democracies and modern economies. This was not some kind of, you know, an attempt to strike a new path, but instead it was a reassertion of European practices and norms. From the very start, the idea was to erase the divide between Western and Eastern Europe and allow these countries to basically become part of Europe again. This meant the adoption of existing liberal democracy and markets. And in some cases, it involved this kind of methodization of a reversion to the status quo ante, to basically sort of, you know, the, to the pre-war period and what that, you know, could have been had these countries not been put under the Soviet yoke. And throughout all of this, what we see basically is enormous ideological consensus. As this project gets launched, and it's a massive project of remaking the economies, remaking the polities, and even remaking the state, right, from the very bottom up. What basically see, we see over and over is a consensus among the mainstream elites. The same kind of consensus that began in 89 now continues. And the consensus is centers around sort of, you know, three different aspects of this return to Europe. The first of this is about liberal democratic institutions, right? And so here the idea is that unless we agree on the rules of the game, the game can't be played. And so all players basically agree to the value of free elections, free courts, to a depoliticized state, to the rule of law, to majority rule with minority rights. And when I say all actors, this includes not just purely political actors, like political parties, presidents, and prime ministers, but also social society, um, sorry, civil society. And also, for example, in the case of Poland, the church who basically sort of, you know, gets, gets policy concessions in an effort for it to fully embrace liberal democracy, something that the Catholic Church has had a somewhat tendentious relationship with um, in the past. Second, this means embracing the free market. And here, you know, international organizations such as the Troika, what becomes known as the Troika, um, the IMF, the World Bank, the ECBRD, all basically push this free market notion. Now, I think it's the, the degree to which the neoliberal consensus existed, I think, is exaggerated. We do see a lot of, sort of you know, local negotiation. For example, the paths of privatization look very different in these countries. There's no sort of, you know, one way to privatize. There was no one way, one way to liberalize the market. The sequencing and the tempo of these reforms also differ. But the general image here is that to free yourself from the inefficiencies of the planned economy, we now have to move to a free market where prices are set by supply and demand, where there is no planning, and where above all, there's a lot of free, you know, free exchange, there's a setting up of um, Securities and Exchange Commission, and basically the creation of capital markets. And this, again, is something that the elites arrive at a large consensus. One of the amazing stories is that whether left or right, governments implement a similar set of pro-market policies. Um, Margaret Havis and Natalia Latke demonstrate this very nicely, so there's an extensive analysis where basically it doesn't matter what the flavor of the mainstream party in power was, the policies were largely within a relatively narrow band. They're basically the same thing. No matter whom you elected, you got the same set of market policies. And finally, and this develops later on, there's the consensus on the return to Europe as also including European Union membership. Now, initially, the European Union, of course, was a faraway goal. Um, the Euro European Union basically hoped to buy off these countries with a series of bilateral agreements. Um, but through sort of a very, you know, this is, a, this is a complicated story that involves both the Yugoslav wars of succession, 
and so you know the changing minds of EU um, elites. This basically shifts in the late 1990s to a far more serious conversation about membership. And here, once again, the elites stand shoulder to shoulder. The European Union membership and the accession process is seen as an unalloyed good. There's very little debate about the potential costs and benefits. It's basically seen as just pure benefit. Um, you know, people are basically told over and over that the future is with the European Union, and there's really sort of no alternative, right? And any time that you find politicians saying there is no alternative, that ought to raise hackles of some sort. And that's exactly what happens in East Central Europe. So given this mainstream agreement on these liberal desiderata, there basically is no sort of public critique. There's no public debate and there's no public criticism that would seriously engage other alternatives. Instead, what happens is that in the late 1990s, we see the rise of several illiberal political parties that emerge as the one set of critics of this elite consensus. They basically criticize this elite consensus. They view it as sort of you know, a corrupt cartel um, between governing elites on the one hand and international forces that would rob these countries of sovereignty on the other. And so we see the rise of these parties, like the League of Polish Families, Self-Defense, Jobbik, um, the Slovak National Party, and so on. And the idea basically is that at the beginning, these parties you know, don't really get that much traction. But what winds up happening basically by 2000 is that they become more and more attractive. The consensus starts to generate its own backlash. And as one mainstream party is tried after another, and as one mainstream party after another delivers the exact same policies, voters start to get restless. Um, and this is you know, documented by people like Grigo Pop Elekes, who basically sort of you know, end by um, Timothy Houghton and Kevin Deegan Krauss, where you basically see sort of you know, this massive churn within the body politic, where parties basically that used to be the mainstream now start being the target of a lot of disappointed voters. And these new liberal parties that arise um, gain more and more power. In some cases, as we'll see, old parties transform themselves into um, anti-liberal parties. In other cases, they rise explicitly with this goal in mind. So the consensus starts to generate its own backlash. And here, the early poster children of reform, places like Hungary, Poland, the Czech Republic, are precisely where we see the greatest liberal takeoff, where these parties travel from the margins to the center of government. So we have you know, the charming, young, scruffy revolutionaries of 1989 that were so attractive to the various observers of politics become the bloated, jaundiced plutocrats um, of the 2000s. And that's, of course, the story of Viktor Orban and Fidesz, a party of young Democrats, sort of, you know, committed young liberals that becomes a conservative populist party in the 1990s. It begins to articulate a nationalist anti-EU set of proposals. It calls for a defense of Hungarian culture and traditions in the face of European hegemony and, uh, and anti-democracy. And it makes city gains. On this set of appeals, basically, it's held two thirds of the seats since 2010. It was in power before then. Um, it kind of alternated with the social, de uh, the social Democrats. It now basically holds a monopoly on power for the last 11 years. In the Czech Republic, we have Andrei Babiš, um, who is a kind of a Trump-like figure, a successful businessman seen as an outsider. Um, he find, founds the action of dissatisfied citizens. And the very name of this party suggests what's going on, right? There's a dissatisfaction with so the existing mainstream. He again offers a critique of corruption, the EU, of democratic institutions. He, for example, dismisses the parliament as just a talking shop. And in the last elections in 2017, he wins 30%. He's now the prime minister, and he's aided and abetted by the uh, what will be charitably called careening presidency of Milos Zeman. And finally, in Poland, we have the Law and Justice Party. This is, of course, Jarosław Kaczynski. The crown on his head is purely coincidental. Um, <laughs> and this is a party that is conservative and populist from the start. Um, in 2015 and 2019, they gained the majority. These are the first single party governments to be formed in Poland. And it too views the post-1989 changes as illegitimate. That very consensus, those round tables that I talked about earlier, it views it as a compromise between communists and liber liberals that sold out Poland's interest and repeatedly calls for the refounding of the Polish Republic. And the problem here is that once these parties get into power, they don't simply deliver the same set of policies that their pre predecessors had. Instead, they systematically and deliberately, as we'll see, erode democracy. Just as a rough guide, 
um, you can see the sort of liberal democracy index. This is from the VDEM data set. And you can see that in all of these countries, once these power parties get into power, there's a steady erosion of liberal democracy, of the rule of law, of autonomous courts, of majority, you know, free and fair elections, um, and of minority rights. And of course, the question is, why does this happen? Why do we see these sort of you know, committed young Democrats then turn against the very democracy that brought them into power and for which they fought so hard earlier? Well, you know, scholars, of course, being a creative lot, have offered explanations that focus on the economic downturn and the crises of 2009 through 2012, on immigration and the threat to sort of national identity that this poses, and on the broader forces of globalization, which of course is you know, the, the, the favorite uh, boogeyman of basically all sort of analysts. It's always about globalization. Um, I swear to God, I have so many undergraduates who begin their essay with, in an increasingly globalized world, something, 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 as if that's responsible. But be that as it may, none of these three explanations fully get us there. Poland, for example, never had an economic downturn. It still sort of chose to elect illiberal populists. Immigration was much more of a threat than a reality in any of these countries. And frankly, Poland accepted a million Ukrainian immigrants without so much as blinking. And third, globalization. If anything, these countries are huge beneficiaries of joining the European Union and its free flow of capital labor, and above all, massive subsidies to these countries. So what happened? I would argue that this illiberal populist surge is really the largely the fault of the mainstream parties. And it's their fault in two ways. In approximate way, the kind of scandals and the self-admitted deception in Hungary, where you know the former Hungarian prime minister from, from the Social Democrats is caught on tape sa saying that you know, we lied to the electorate day and night about the economic situation. So there are the sort of short-term scandals, right, that surround these parties that prompt voters to, to elect other parties. But there's this broader problem of the return to Europe and the elite consensus being increasingly seen as selling out the country and not providing any new policy alternatives. That this is basically, you know, a sort of um, a muting of political debate in the name of elite, of what the elites perceive are these analoid public goods. And this isn't just happening in Poland, Hungary, or the Czech Republic. In fact, if we look at liberal populist votes in Europe, there's a steady rise. Um, the green line on the bottom here are developed democracies, basically, so you know, the old EU countries. And you can see that in the mid 90s, um, there's kind of a blip up. And these parties basically finally crossed the 5% threshold um, and basically tripled their support um, since 1995. In the, the, in post-communist democracies, these parties already get a higher percentage of the vote, right? They start around 20, 22%, and they have effectively, in the last elections, basically doubled it. So what we have is, is this increasing turn away from mainstream political parties, from the social democrats and the Christian democrats, towards much more sort of the parties that question the very, um, the very institutions of liberal democracy. And what all these parties, as populists and liberal parties, have in common are two claims. They claim that the elites are a corrupt and self-serving cartel, and that they, be, they are better suited to representing the people as such and their interests. And this, of course, is the famous definition of Kasmude, who's basically been a major contributor to this, um, to this debate. Now, of course, this is nothing new. This kind of populism isn't new, but it does carry with it serious implications, especially for these newer democracies. The implication here is that the kind of elite consensus that drove democratic, democratic transformation in East Central Europe is seen as prima facie evidence of the cartel, right? Of basically a corrupt elite um, that has not only sort of sold out the country's interests, but has also, also built formal institutions that cannot be trusted, right? So because the formal institutions are the sort of, you know, the spawns of this corrupt elite cartel, they are not to be trusted. And instead, direct representation is necessary. We need referenda, we need plebiscites, we need rallies, much more than we need elections and independent courts. Secondly, if they are to be represented, the people need to be defined. And this, of course, is where the devil's in the details. Because what winds up happening is a division of country into the good partisan loyalists and the opposition, who by definition are traitors to the national cause. And the result is an erosion of liberal democracy. Now, the significance of these earlier high uh, percentages of votes that the parties got in both Poland and Hungary is that this gives the parties enormous discretion. Fidesz, by gaining two thirds of the votes, gained a constitutional supermajority. It could rewrite the constitution, and of course it chose to do that. In Poland, peace has the majority to rule alone, 
and basically does not have to contend with any kind of opposition, um, so, you know, scuppering its, uh, its goals. So this basically gives these parties enormous discretion, and they immediately use it. And there are three targets of this kind of liberal political parties, of this kind of democratic erosion. And that is the formal institutions, which again are seen as these corrupt creatures of this elite cartel, informal norms of tolerance and forbearance, and finally the politics of identity, redefining who the very people are in partisan terms. So let's take a brief look at what this looks like. First, there are the formal institutions. And this almost follows a template. We see this template not just in Poland and in Hungary. We also see it in Turkey. We also um, see it in Venezuela. We see it in several other places. And the template goes as follows. First, attack the courts. Politicize them, uh, make sure that judges are no longer autonomous, make sure that the laws themselves can now target individuals, for example, or be retroactive rather than the kind of um, liberal rule of law that we would like to see. Secondly, go after the oversight and regulatory institutions, the ombudsman. Um, there's a recent scandal in Poland right now about the human rights ombudsman and the way in which he's basically being pushed out of office. Then go after civil society and universities. These are brought to heel most notably in Hungary, where basically all sort of civil society organizations now face rather onerous registration requirements. And the one independent university, the Central European University, basically got kicked out and is now in Vienna. And finally, if you have the power, rewrite the constitution and the electoral laws. And here I think Hungary is an outlandish example of what this looks like, where over the course of six months, from the election basically to um, the end of the year, the party rewrote the constitution on an iPad um, and just basically pushed it through. And the constitution, for example, now places all the entire court system under parliamentary oversight and named one person to be in charge of naming of all the different judges um, in Hungary. That person conveniently happened to be the wife of the second in command of the governing party. So what you see basically is a sort of an undermining and a um, erosion of the formal institutions. And the goal here is very simple. All of these institutions would other, otherwise provide criticism, they would provide opposition, they would provide oversight. And now with them basically in the hands of the governing parties, you can ensure incumbency without any challengers and you can minimize the costs of a potential loss of power. And this of course happens despite massive protests and mobilization. These are Hungarian protests against the new constitution. Um, these are the protests in the Polish parliament and outside of the constitutional court. But because these populist governments have outright majorities, this protest is largely ineffective. If anything, what basically happens is that they justify their actions by saying, we have the majority of the population behind us. And these opponents really have nothing to say to us because they're not real Poles and real Hungarians. Secondly, you have attacks on the informal norms of liberal democracy, which I would argue are every bit as important as the formal institutions. And so the opposition is criticized and dismissed. Um, it's fact, it's heavily marginalized and it's seen as you know, the barking dogs of the opposition. Media is denounced and its access is often limited. Um, in the Hungarian case, you basically see um, the very systematic erosion of the free media by through basically um, starving non-government supporting media of ad revenue and having it all go to pro-government uh, sources. In Poland, you now have efforts to repolonize newspapers and the media that are partially owned by foreign investors. We see the sort of loss of informal accountability as you know, donor names and sort of, you know, the networks that usually were made fairly transparent are now basically made entirely opaque and any kind of conflict of interest norms are largely abandoned. And finally, there are the politics of identity. This is a reimagining of both national history and of who belongs into the people in the people. We have a division of society into good and bad. In fact, Jarosław Kaczyński explicitly referred to the worst sort of Poles, the kind who don't support the party. There's a statement that you know, the opposition is seen as traitors. If these parties represent the true Poland, the true Hungary, the true Czech Republic, then by definition, the opposition is a bunch of is basically treasonous. And above all, only certain groups belong to society. So former communists don't belong to society. Um, you know, sexual minorities, um, whether gays or, or transgender people don't belong to society. Religious minorities and, and above all immigrants don't belong in this society. And you have these edifices that are basically you know, built to um, propagate this, so to see, this narrative. This is the house of terror in Budapest, which basically equates the communist era with Nazi crimes, right? 
Ironically enough, there's a Katyn exhibition, which is of course a reference to the murder of Polish officers by the Soviet army, which is viewed as basically a crime that of, a, of a communist government and evidence of the, so the, 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 um, the, so the heavy burden that the communist regimes bore. Of course, um, there are attacks on George Soros and other um, quote unquote international cosmopolitan figures. Um, this is you know, a poster from the 2017 National Consultation on Immigration, where it's explicit, right? This is a government sponsored billboard that says, let's not have, let's not let have Soros have the last laugh, right? It's basically an attack on one man who's seen as antithetical to everything that this government stands for. He's liberal, he's an internationalist, he's Jewish, and he is independently wealthy. And for Kaczynski, this image of reconciliation and cooperation of an elite consensus on some set of political values is now an evidence of an elite cartel and collaboration that precludes true democracy in Poland. He basically views images like this as evidence that the cartel has existed and that was basically some kind of you know, an evil plot to prevent a truly free Poland from arising. And ironically enough, Kaczynski, Orban, and others basically are coordinating, right? There's an international aspect to this as well. They hold multiple meetings, they share the same template, they defend each other when the EU sort of wags its finger from time to time at the two parties, and they basically articulate this shared vision of a populist and illiberal future for their countries. Um, all of this is presented, as this uh, poster says, as a defense of Europe against the madness of the left and the Islamists, right? And again, it's this sort of language of, you know, that's the elite cartel that we're fighting against. So this democratic erosion that I'm talking about is both a mechanism, right? A way of eliminating criticism, um, eliminating oversight and weakening the alternative. And it's also a goal. It's entrenching liberal incumbents in power. Um, and all of it goes back to this elite consensus that formed initially around um, these basic values of democracy, a return to Europe and the free market which basically led both to a disappointment with the, by the voters with the lack of alternatives and for these uh, parties sort of evidence of just how much the cartel had existed all along and how they are there to fight against it. Now, this is not all bad news. I don't want to end the evening on an entirely pessimistic note. Um, there are sort of two bits of hope. One is that illiberal populist parties tend to be punished at higher rates than others. And two, that support for liberal democracy within these countries remains high. So if you look at sort of, you know, these are basically the data, this is the data for all European elections after 1945. Populists basically get punished at higher electoral rates than other parties. Um, the populists here are in gray. Of course, that doesn't include those parties that basically get into power and can rewrite the electoral rules, which is exactly what's happening in Hungary. Secondly, um, support for democracy remains high. This is basically sort of, you know, support for liberal democracy. It's a poll taking, um, I think, two years ago by the Pew Research Center. And you can see that across Europe, huge majorities support, um, support democracy, including um, those in Poland and in Hungary. So in the end, um, what I would argue is that the transformation and erosion of democracy that we see in the region is this grand irony of the very forces that building democracy, elite consensus and a push for reform, then allow the undermining and erosion of liberal democracy. I would also say that I think these post-communist post illiberal populists are really the vanguard of a broader shift in European politics, which is also marked by a disappointment with mainstream parties and a feeling of a lack of accountability and lack of responsiveness from parties that tend to offer similar policy bundles to voters year after year. So as a result, this return to Europe has produced a spate of illiberal populists in the regions who are basically you know, eating away at the very institutions of democracy that the elite consensus had earlier built. And this very consensus on the desirability of markets, Europe and the European Union has produced its own backlash. Um, that has basically begun to dismantle liberal democratic institutions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. We can, okay, great. We are back to the, so I'm opening the uh, floor for uh, questions, but I'm going to use my own prerogative as a chair. Thank you very, very much for the talk. I will start by asking you about the consensus, uh, because I find I find it so important that you highlighted its importance in producing this illiberal politics. And I would like 
to ask you to, um, to tell us a bit more about it and to what extent the constant emphasis on the consensus is also a problem now for like overcoming this, this populist moment. Because I think what we have all seen in last year that that was especially, I think, visible at the very beginning of the peace rule in Poland, when all the people who were like criticizing the peace takeover power saying, we need to come back to normality. And this normality is always defined in the very same terms. And, and precisely because there is no other normality, like nobody wants to entertain any other political scenario. Perhaps this is the way, the way many people are fed up with this and they say, we want to have another narrative about another normality and, and consider other social political scenarios and not always this common set of factors, free market and the, well, what you said at the beginning about the importance of Sweden, right? As an alternative, I don't think it's actually very, very often considered at the moment. So if you could say something more about this problematic consensus. Right. So I think yeah, the problematic, the consensus is problematic um, in two ways. One is that it basically, um, ironically enough, fragments the opposition, right? And what you see in both Poland and Hung Hungary is an opposition that's unable to offer a distinct alternative to this. Right. They basically, you know, it's exactly as you say, they're kind of spinning their wheels and ask for a return to normality. But the return of norm to normality is basically not peace and not fetus. Kind of like in the United States, the return to normality was not Trump, which does very little to sort of you know, address the systematic structural problems that might lie underneath. Um, I think the second issue is that this is not easily, I, I, you know, when I say that there's this elite consensus and it produces this backlash, that's not to say that this is easily reversible. And part of that has to do with the fact that if you look at, you know, the, there are these broader forces that Adam identified in the, the, previous, uh, the previous lecture, um, but there are also these forces, you know, that basically make it very difficult for parties to be more responsive and accountable to the voters in the ways that voters would want them to. Um, it does seem like you know, it, 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 parties are now increasingly being captured either by the state or by, um, in the United States case, by very, sort of, you know, very wealthy donors. Um, there is sort of a sense in which the policies on offer can't really differ that much. The wealthier state in Europe is fraying at the edges. Um, and of course, the standard argument that is that if we have immigrants, it'll fray even further, which is totally water for the mill of these, of these parties. Um, there isn't sort of an alternative to the free market and especially to the free flow of capital, labor and whatnot that's enshrined in the European Union. So on the one hand, you know, I think this is this elite consensus um, is sort of you know, a rhetorical device that's being used by the populace. On the other hand, I think there is a real problem with mainstream political parties everywhere. Um, in Germany, in the United States, in Poland and Hungary, with sort of their inability to offer something different to the voters, or at least to convince their vo to the voters that they're accountable and responsible um, to the people who elected them. Thank you. Uh, I will, well, maybe there is room later for some other questions from me, but now <laughs> I have to open the floor and I have a long list already, but I saw Yanis was raising hand as one of the first. And so go ahead, Yanis, please. No, actually, I was applauding before, and then I put my. Uh, okay, then, but okay, you are already talking, so please, you already unmuted yourself, so please go ahead with your question. Uh, okay, I mean, I don't want to jump the queue, but okay. Um, so thank you, first of all, um, Anna, for the, for the presentation, and maybe it's it's not a bad idea if I um, to ask my question now because it kind of relates to to the silver lining you presented in the end, which is the high the continuous high support for democracy. Hmm. Um, my question then would be, do we know what people mean when they hear the word democracy? Because like not even Orban or Kaczynski, et cetera, are, are saying that they are dismantling democracy. They're just proposing a different kind of democracy. Which yes, is, that's my question they, they too. Speak of... Maybe I can add to that. Uh, well, let's let Liano, Yanis finish and then it... The... Yeah, okay. so are you? Did you? Think yeah, of uh, yeah. Just I mean, they I mean they speak about a liberal democracy. Um, I mean, just like perhaps I mean the previous regimes were talking about people's democracy. By the way, so I mean, it seems like there it's it's hardly possible to articulate a legitimate vision of um, of rule that does not contain the word democracy. So yeah, we're all for democracy, but what does it mean? Right. So please, if you want to, so Mr. Gabrish. Uh, if you want to now jump in. Yeah, very briefly. Uh, two years ago, Danny Rorick published a paper uh, 
uh, study and differentiated between the so-called electoral democracy and the liberal democracy. And electoral democracy, that means you have a majority voting, but the majority does not care about uh, the rights, minority rights. And that is a point when you show us 75%, then we do not know what it is. It could be that illiberal, that liberal democracy has support only 10 or 15 or 20 percent. Even in Germany and in Western, uh, in Western European countries, uh, I don't. I think that most people believe that electoral democracy is that what they have. No, so I, I, those are excellent comments, um, and I agree that you know democracy is something that is both a desideratum and something that is a, such an elastic category that it can sort of encompass you know a, a lot. That particular question actually asks about support for liberal democracy, and that was defined as uh, majority rule with minority rights and the rule of law. So that support exists, but you know in many ways I think this is sort of you know the uh, if you it, 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 this, this is almost you know the the sort of it's a compliment that populists pay to this notion, even as they uh, violate its tenets, right? In the sense that um, populists and these illiberal, these illiberal parties are not opposed to democracy because that's how they stay in power, right? And that's how they get into power. And it's in fact a fantastic way to legitimate themselves when they can say, look, the majority of the population supports us. So clearly what we're doing is the right thing. So it's not that these parties are anti-democratic in the sense that they'll abandon elections or they'll start sort of, you know, to, to do away with courts altogether. It's that they view that in the sort of, you know, and, and Ron Trucks, by the way, Danny's distinction is not a new one, right? I mean, we've known about sort of, you know, democracy of adjectives for decades and decades now. Um, and so this idea that, you know, this minimalist notion of democracy as we hold elections, we get into power, and now we can do what we want, is very much the one that these parties subscribe to. It's not necessarily the one that the populations of these countries see. Um, they still support liberal democracy, and many of them view these parties as still subscribing to those notions. These ideas aren't contested, right? If you look, if you talk to a lot of polls about, for example, the courts, um, they'll say, you know, look, the, the courts, of course, the courts ought to, ought to have been purged. And of course, the, we had to have court reforms because the court system is inefficient and it's full of old communist judges. So again, you know, a lot of this has to do, you know, what we view from the outside as doing away with the autonomy of the courts is presented and seen by many voters as um, a sort of a necessary extirpation of authoritarian legacies from the judicial system. Um, so, you know, again, these are very elastic terms and there's quite a bit of, and that's part of the reason why these parties can manipulate them so easily. Thank you. So I have Ms. Asmanova on the list. Um, perhaps you could just present yourself briefly. Yes, I'm Albana Zmanova. I'm a politics professor at the University of Kent, and I'm currently a fellow at uh, the IWM in Vienna. Um, I also um, grew up under communism. Um, I was one of the um, organizers of the student strike, so I, I was a dissident, so I went through that. And my, my question is, um, about the, the, the entry point of this crit wonderful critique we, we, we heard. And the entry point is a certain consensus uh, that emerged just immediately after um, the fall of communism, if understood well. Um, in my recollection though, that consensus indeed of political elites driving the transition with the idea of changing, of, of, of joining Europe with market uh, economy or you know, capitalism and liberal democracy. Actually, at least in the Bulgarian context that I knew, that was not the prevailing uh, consensus among the dissidents. So in fact, um, Václav Havel's position was very popular among us. Um, namely, Havel uh, used to say that um, liberal democracy and, and capitalism are uh, 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 sorry, uh, that capitalist uh, liberal democracies and uh, kind of state socialism are two iterations of the same toxic logic of modernity. Um, he used that uh, notion of um, samo pohip, was it? Like a safe waste. So mm -hmm. we were in a search for an alternative actually between the two, um, the two um, quasi uh, the, the two models. And so here is my, here's my question. 
was it maybe the downfall of democracy uh, 20 years down the road? How, maybe it has something to do with the fact that these societies were never allowed to develop their own alternative, that they were actually hijacked into this forced imported consensus through the very easy option of changing the EU. Um, so this is just a hypothesis. This has always been something that I've been thinking about. Thank you very um, much. Taking the opportunity to ask. Thank you for the question. Um, so yeah, I, I would say two things. I would say, first of all, yes, there are definitely voices from the start who are worried about sort of, you know, the neoliberal consensus and the kind of the damage that this could do. But they were roundly dismissed and marginalized, right? I mean, you know, Havel was dismissed as sort of, you know, the philosopher on the hill by people like Klaus who actually made policy. Um, and I think that's what's critical, right? I mean, whatever alternative, and I don't mean to suggest that somehow this was a system that was imposed on these countries. There are elites and elite politicians who ran towards these goals because they saw no other alternative. This was the quickest way to get away from the inefficiency and the, and the crimes of the communist era, right? And so I don't blame them in any way for, for doing this. And I certainly don't think that this was an imposition as much. I mean, there's a lot of agency here. Um, and so these, these elites embraced this system. They ran with it, with the, you know, in many cases, with the best of intentions not realizing that you know, telling people over and over that there's no alternative will eventually cause them to lose trust. Thank you, so I have now, so Anastasia, please go ahead with your question. Thank you so much. And um, thank you so much for this fascinating talk. And I think my question quite neatly adjuncts the previous one, uh, probably pushing it slightly further. And it's probably the first time in my life that I want, to, want you to say that is a very stupid, obnoxious question or a very stupid impression. Please prove me wrong. Um, my personal impression of um, these transformative processes and the seeming proneness of post-communist regimes to this backlash we experience currently, uh, has to do with this lack of mainstream tradition uh, or a certain red line behind what you did before, which means in a society where several generations lived through the discourse that sanctions and suppresses any sort of politically dissenting opinion uh, in a rather crude way, uh, no public discussion is possible about it. Um, I can't count how many times my mother, in my personal uh, impression, had a heart attack about me going to a demonstration, for example, because it's just like this does not fit her own experience, her own socialization, because only those suicidal guys do that. This is how you grow up in that regime. And you cannot really experience, this is pretty much what you already started talking about, so probably just a comment, it's like uh, the mainstream democracy is also prone to, this, to uh, this lack of discussion and catastrophizing any, um, any possible, uh, yes, fluctuation of opinion. And in this regard, I would probably, I would like to finish on a very, uh, once again, in a thankfulness, uh, because I think your talk shows us pretty well that also in uh, traditional democracies, as we would call them, uh, you also definitely need, now you want to have this stupid revaccination joke. All of us need revaccination of democratic discourses and values. And otherwise we do all experience some sort of autocratic backlash or, Yes, thank you very much for showing that, I think, yes. So thank you, and I think you actually, you know, brilliantly answered your own question, right? So I don't think this has much to do with, this kind of discussed with the elite consensus and with what it produces, has less to do with ones being socialized in a communist or an authoritarian regime and everything to do with what the elite parties are offering. And the reason I say that is because this is happening everywhere. Right. I mean, look at Germany, for example, where, you know, the two bastions of post-war democracy, the CDU and the SPD, are both losing votes to the Greens and to the IFT. Right. I mean, you know, alternative parties are arising that are capitalizing on what is seen as sort of a lack of accountability, lack of responsiveness and a lack of alternatives that mainstream parties offer. And that has very little to do with being socialized in a communist regime or an authoritarian regime and everything to do with just, you know, the mainstream parties not being able to offer new alternatives. We've run out of ideas um, in the center. Um, 
Uh, thank you. So I have another Reddit member now, Lynn. Lynn, floor is yours. Um, hello, thank you, Professor Jamala Busa, for this wonderful talk. Uh, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at Reddit. And I have a question about this um, elite thesis. So, so is, is, I mean, these elite, they're not some kind of disembodied um, individuals there, right? As you said, Yaroslav Karczynski, he himself was somehow, um, I guess, disappointed with the outcomes of the, of the roundtable negotiations. But what if we were to actually historicize a bit this elite thesis and just to say that um, there is just a very strong um, conservative tradition, political thought, intelligentsia in the history of Poland in comparison to, to, for example, the relative weakness of liberalism or communism or socialism, right? So perhaps there is just simply this kind of very long underlining uh, kind of um, current or actually very visible um, strand, intellectual strand that shaped generations before and after the war of intellectuals, including Jarosław Kaczynski, but also the, 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 the voters, right? So those grassroots uh, interventions that perhaps, you know, they needed the elites to trigger their voting patterns, but perhaps it is just a much more of a, I don't know, um, it's, it's more in the habitus, if you want, collective habitus of the Polish society, if you, if you want. Mm. Um, so perhaps if, you know, as a historian, we could kind of historicize this elite thesis. And a second point that I want to make is that your, also your account on of, of this of the current situation, at least in Poland, is a very negative one in the sense that you present it as a reactionary tool, as a reactionary tool, domestic, but also um, international events. Um, and I'm thinking that perhaps, uh, yeah, maybe that's the generation of, Kac of Kaczynski, this kind of late dissident, but maybe the young conservative Poles who are actually very global, well-read, they read all you know different languages, and who are now very much toying with the idea of post-colonialism, and they completely you know tap, tap into this kind of post-colonial mentality of Poland, this discourse in niepodległości, right? This kind of independence discourse is just everywhere. Um, this kind of notion of autonomy that maybe they will actually be will be able to kind of articulate a solid conservative, bizarrely post-colonial discourse that will actually last, and, and perhaps that's 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 a possibility. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, I, my first and very quick reaction is that liberal parties don't do well anywhere, right? I mean, you know, would, would, I'm doing some research with Monica Alep, and what we find is that. True liberal parties, you know, parties that situate themselves both on the free market and a very cosmopolitan understanding of what the national culture ought to be like, consistently get, you know, they have loyal electorates. They don't get punished electorally, but those electorates are tiny. And I think what you're pinpointing to is less, you know, kind of a um, the, the national spirit of, of Poland than something much simpler, which is that there's a rural urban divide that I think is structuring politics in ways that we have truly not appreciated, partly because we all live in cities, right? And we're all part of this sort of you know, wonderful um, intelligentsia. But if you look at Poland, if you look at um, uh, Turkey, if you look at the United States, the rural areas feel left behind, they feel condescended to, they feel patronized. They feel like no one cares about who, you know, their very real experience and their very real concerns. And it's the power of people like Kaczynski or Trump or, or um, Orban who can then say and say, no, but I do care about you. And you are the real Poland. You are the real United States. Let's make this country great again by addressing what you want and your concerns. And that's, I think, where these parties derive enormous amounts of power. Um, and you'll notice that, you know, I mean, Poland is still a rural country, as is Turkey, as surprisingly enough as the United States, where large swathes of the population still live in, you know, very sparsely populated rural areas, and they feel totally left behind. And so these parties are less conservative than they are illiberal in that they want to make this minority basically achieve majority status in the country. Um, and that's, I think, sort of, you know, is, is the sort of the common thread that runs through here. Um, when it comes to, you know, the sort of decolonization um, discourse, I find it fascinating. The Polish version to me is absolutely fascinating because the young conservative version in the United States is the neo-right, right? And so how do you steer that sort of, you know, anti-democratic versus anti-colonial discourse um, that I think a lot of these people are sort of, you know, trying to articulate in common? And I don't you know, and that I don't have an answer to. Thank you. So I have Mr. Charles Turner and he wrote in the chat a question about PR systems. I hope it doesn't mean I have to ask this question that you are going to develop. <laughs> the floor is yours. Uh... Um, my question already. Oh dear. Okay. I wasn't quite ready. Um, well, I just I just wondered if you if you had any thoughts about um, about if you like PR systems and uh, how to make them work. <laughs> 
and whether that has any bearing on what's what's happened in Eastern Europe, because, well, all right, the Hungarian PR system is utterly perverse in the sense that, you know, in the second round of counting, the party that did well in the first round gets, gets a, a double reward, which is not how it's supposed to work. But there's an interesting phenomenon, I think, of what happens when a party manages to get a parliamentary majority in a PR system. Because in a way, PR systems are supposed to not, not produce that kind of outcome. They're supposed to say to people, listen, this is the political culture we have. You can vote for your smaller party and your vote won't be wasted. But somehow we've got a situation in, in Poland, Hungary, and, and Turkey's like that as well, where you have parliamentary, parliamentary majority within a PR system. And I just wonder whether there's any kind of connection we might make between the, the boldness of policy making Mm -hmm. And um, you know, having on the ha and having achieved a parliamentary majority in a PR system. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think, like Anastasia, I think you've answered it right. The common thread are parliamentary systems. You know, if you know a parliamentary system by definition doesn't have the checks and balances that a presidential system does, right? You basically are electing you're, you're electing your legislature and your executive with one vote. And as a result, there's already one less barrier to these kinds of radical transformations. And you're absolutely right. PR systems are designed to keep these kinds of super majorities by one party from forming. But when they do, this lack of checks and balances can produce these outlandish outcomes that you see in Hungary. I mean, you know, if you look at the United States, that's an SMD system, right? Single member districts. And yet it produced someone like Trump. Um, who then basically, because he basically took over the Republican Party and was able to ride that all the way to the presidency. But he wasn't able to achieve everything that he wanted to, partly because, you know, two years into his presidency, the Congress was, was democratic. Um, and so I think that's the critical aspect here. So, you know, the parliamentary nature of the system, rather whether it's PR or SMD. Um, and to some extent, you know, the same thing can be said about Britain, right? I mean, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, but that's why I'm asking. But I mean, OK, yeah, elective dictatorship. Yes. Although there may be, there are, it's, an interest, it's interesting the way in which the first past the post system, which we all say, oh, is not democratic. Somehow there's a there's a way that British the British system has allowed people to kind of make it work in a certain way. Well, you know, this is where this is where Bishop Stubbs kind of comes in, right? And you know, the eight hundred years of uh, British parliamentary democracy and that experience. I mean, that's a facetious okay. answer. But even if you know, if you look in Britain, right? I mean, someone like Boris Johnson is not a serious fig figure, right? This is someone who, again, rode the party. He, trans he, in some ways, much like Trump, transformed the party in order to arrive where he is. Um, and the whole story of Brexit is, again, of sort of, you know, having the party basically being taken over, or rather the political system being taken over by a bunch of demagogues who presented sort of, you know, false arguments um, about a critical issue that got just enough people, again, from the rural areas to vote along. Well, I, I, I've got something to say about rural and urban, but um, especially in Turkey, but I'll, I'll leave I'll, I'll leave it there. Yes, okay. we're moving forward. Thank you. So I have Miss Anna Kalori on the list. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes. Um, thanks, uh, Anna Kalori. I'm a future fellow at uh, Recet. Uh, thanks a lot for, for this talk. And um, you hinted a little bit uh, uh, to the question that I was going to, to ask you in the answer to Lynn already. My question is about the link between deindustrialization in this region and uh, new surges of, of uh, illiberalism and uh, uh, non-liberal or illiberal parties. Um, and my question is, how do we grapple analytically with the fact that these illiberal parties somewhat bring back uh, labor and the question of inequality uh, at the center of the political debate in Central Eastern Europe, but I'm also thinking of Italy and even the US. So how do we how do we grapple with this apparent contradiction? Is it an apparent contradiction or how do we deal with it? Thanks. Sure. Um, so, you know, for these parties, this isn't a contradiction at all. They represent the true people. The true people are not, you know, these kind of um, elites with mobile assets and mobile skills who can do whatever they want and live any place they can. The real people are those who are rooted in society, who sort of represent traditional values, et cetera, et cetera. And so for them, you know, this is actually an ideal constituency. But the way they address labor policy has less to do with sort of you know, innovative new, uh, creating new support for creative 
creating support for innovative new economic sectors and much more with direct subsidies. Right. So in Poland, you know, there are basically direct subsidies to families with children. In Hungary, there are housing subsidies for, again, young families who promise to have children. And, you know, by definition, almost these days, you know, after the demographic transition, people with more kids tend to live in poor, more rural, less educated areas. Right. Um, and so what they do basically is they very much bring up inequality. They very much say that this is, you know, the fault of these elites that have been in power for so long. And they address it through basically direct income transfers. Um, rather than you know, industrial policy or anything sort of more, more proactive like that. Thank you. So now, Philip, mm, your turn. Yeah, thanks. I could also wait them as a host. Um, but okay. Oh, why? Very many questions. Okay, I, I will be, I, I will be uh, quick. One is a very brief comment. Um, that is on, you know, uh, the Czech Republic, where I think, you know, I'm, I have no sympathies for Babish for a variety of reasons. However, I think this is more kind of a really Berlusconi type of guy, of course, with an interesting STB past. Um, but I think it's not worse than the grand coalition agreement between Klaus and Zema. Um, you know, a level of corruption, a level of attack on institutions, this kind of grand coalition but it's it's not um, it's very different from what's happening in in, in Poland and Hungary. I'm not worried about mm -hmm. democracy, yes. about you know uh, stealing votes and all that. that. That's the brief comment. And now the questions. And this is more about political science research, which I don't know. So, um, uh, but 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 you might know you might be doing. And this is one um, that I, what I call the dynamics of self radicalization. Um, I once heard a talk about uh, from Nadia Urbinati at a meeting in Genova, and, and she stressed a lot that there's a big difference between writing populism as a movement, but then writing populism as a kind of governance. And I think that is very true. And what I'm always um, uh, puzzled about is how is there research about this trend that once they get to government, it gets ever more radical? Is mm -hmm. that because? You know, only radical speech acts uh, get you up in the in, in the right wing populist parties, and then eventually people believe um, you know the radical nonsense they're telling. Um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not so sure whether Orban, for example, came out as an anti-Semite and you know, and uh, the population expansion, all these theories. But by now, since he has repeated it so often. I surmise that he himself was believing it. You know, not everybody is a complete cynic. Um, and even complete cynics might eventually believe the message they're telling. So this is the question that the, about the dynamics of self-radicalization, which I think was also so obvious if you look at Trump. I mean, mm -hmm. who would have conceived of um, that how it would end at the, at the start? And, mm -hmm. and the second question is then another kind of dynamics. This is Okay, if we then get, um, in, let's say, more stable democracies, um, a backlash from the backlash, democratic victory in the states, like we have had it, um, is there also going to be a new dialectics between, um, you know, power changes between, let's say, mainstream, fairly technocratic, reformist, liberal, um, you know, variations of, of political mainstream, and then um, again and again, really, you know, a writing opposition, a hard one taking over power. So, because in the old systems, which you described like SPD, CDU and all that, you know, the, the social democrats, the big parties, uh, there was a smooth transition of power. And now we have had a transition back after the backlash to the democrats, but how, is there any, any kind of idea how that might unfold or has unfolded in the, in the recent past? I mean, we've seen it in Poland, right? Peace, back to liberal, but then back to peace, but uh, even worse than before, and not back anymore, as it seems now. Is that the new dynamic that, you know, it flips maybe two times, but then it stops flipping because of the power grabbing? Mm -hmm. um, so to address these in reverse order, I think first regarding sort of, you know, the, the power shift, the whole point of undermining so much of the liberal democratic institutions is to prevent the power shift from happening, right? And that's both through basically making the opposition's life extremely difficult 
and through building up sort of new, uh, sort of shifting the Overton window and building a new kind of populist politics as the norm in these countries. So, you know, I don't see, I mean, you know, if you, if you look at the changes in the constitution or the, so, you know, the kind of subsidies that, the, that peace is offering, um, these aren't intended to make the opposition's life any easier. And they're certainly not intended to make it likely that the opposition can come back to power. If you, know, if you see what happened in the United States, right? I mean, Trump left office because basically he was given no choice, but he did not do so gracefully. And he has, you know, violated a fundamental informal norm of democracy, which is that you accept defeat. And instead, you know, now 60% of Republicans in the United States believe that the election was a fraud and that it's deeply, it was deeply fraudulent and it was stolen from Trump precisely because he told them that, that that's what happened. Um, and that brings me to my second question about, so, you know, your second question about self-radicalization. I think, you know, this is where the concept of useful idiots is very helpful, right? Because it's not as if these people necessarily self-radicalize, they encourage others to do it for them. And this is where, you know, the media environment plays a huge role, where various allies play a huge role. They're the ones who radicalize people for the sort of, you know, the, the populist leaders, the illiberal leaders, which makes them that it gives them that much more legitimacy. It makes it seem like there are other people who are signing up. And above all, it sort of absolves the responsibility from the dear leader. Um, and you see, you know, Trump doing that, you see, um, you know, Orban doing that, you see Kaczynski doing that, you see the Polish Catholic Church doing that where there are these, so these very useful radicals who say the things that the leaders themselves won't say, but which then again, shift the Overton window and create this atmosphere where this is normal, this is acceptable. It's now okay to be anti-Semitic, to be a racist, to, you know, to threaten women with death because they, um, they you know, espouse gender ideology and things like that. And so I think useful idiots are, is a critical concept here for how both sort of the, the political rhetoric gets shifted oftentimes in very durable ways and how these people stay in power because they can claim um, plausible deniability. Um, and finally, on the Czech Republic, you know, it, it, you're absolutely right. I mean, they did. They, you know, Babish does not run the country single-handedly. He has, you know, he's a, his is the biggest party in parliament. This may change in October, but it's a, you know, to me, what was more interesting was the fact that he got to power on the same kind of critique that Orban and Kaczynski offered, right, of the Soviet elite consensus. It's just that, you know, Czechs basically hadn't gotten, you know, as a much more urban country, right, they hadn't gotten where Poland and Hungary um, had. Um, but the rhetoric is the same, the appeals are the same, and the constituencies are identical. So now I have two questions that were actually posted into the chat. I will summarize them. So the one is about the three points you made, which, according to Christian, are a general pattern of a guide how to take over power. And the questions related to that are, uh, when it comes to formal institutions, is it, in your opinion, something specific to Eastern Europe? Um, second question, when it comes to the norms, uh, is it the general pattern that, for example, countries of Hungary and Poland are just ahead of our development? So some, And when it comes to politics of identity, is it some kind of a natural de democratic development out of autocratic societies? Can we talk about the model as such? And, and here, the example he's giving is, if you think of the democratization process in Germany and Austria after the Second World War, the process of polarization in 1968 and in 1969 seems to be structurally similar, even regarding the 20, 30 years time lag. So that would be the question. So, you know, I think that this is a much broader pattern. Um, and Larry Diamond has this beautiful little short book called Ill Winds, which sort of nicely documents this. Um, but the template is identical. Um, it's achieved with various emphasis and various degrees of success. But we see leaders in Thailand, in the Philippines, in India, in Venezuela, in um, you know, now in Peru, um, in Ecuador, in the United States, in Poland, in Hungary, in Turkey, in Venezuela, all try the same exact template. Now, they may not always succeed. Some emphasize what, some aspects more than others, but you know, this is basically the same template that's been used um, across the world by illiberal leaders. And I think this has less to do with an emergence from authoritarianism and the fragility of democracy than it does with sort of, you know, the power of appeals to a sort of you know, disappointed um, and disaffected electorate. Because you see the same kind of patterns, you know, take place in the United States, right? Which supposedly is a 200 year old democracy that never experienced this kind of authoritarianism. Um, and yet, you know, this is, this is relatively widespread. And so I think this is much more to do with the forces that produce these mainstream politics than it does with the specific sort of um, developmental paths or historical paths that these countries take. 
And another question, thank you, uh, that has been posted by Tom Yunus. So both scholars and political commentators have observed that the opposition or the mainstream has a problem with formulating an, a, an alternative. There, but little has been said about what kind of alternative could actually be successful or could it be that there is no alternative that might be successful enough at the moment. Do you have an idea of how such a successful alternative should look like? Right. Um, right. So now, you, Tom, you're asking me to basically uh, be the strategist for the entire opposition in, uh, in Poland and Hungary. So sure, yeah. Um, so I think you know there, there are sort of three critical things that people are very concerned about um, that could be easily combined with liberal democracy, right? And those concerns are first, first and foremost about um, corruption and the extent to which in all these countries, you know, being in high office means you get to benefit considerably from that high office. Um, you know, there's a vast new scandals in Poland that keep reappearing over and over again, most recently with the Bytec. Um, so that's one. There's corruption. And, you know, as again, as Kevin Deegan Krauss and Tim Houghton demonstrate, that's an incredibly powerful appeal for new parties to make. Um, unfortunately, all too often, they themselves then fall victim to this, those same forces and basically engage in corruption themselves. So an anti-corruption appeal. I think a redefining of the nation as committed to democracy, as sort of a new articulation of a civic nationalism that, for example, emphasizes you know, the democratic traditions of a given country. Um, and that doesn't sort of you know, just make, you know, make national identity about conservatism and is you know, parochial conservatism that relies on conservative religion, but instead one that reaches back to the democratic traditions in all of these countries. I mean, Poland and Hungary, for example, had functioning parliaments in the Middle Ages, right? That ought to be something that needs to be brought up and that, ought to, you know, that can be another sort of way of reorganizing national identity. And that of course is a long-term project. That's not anything that can be done immediately. But above all, the third thing that new parties have to do is actually pay attention to what the voters want. And that means not just relying on Warsaw and Budapest as so your main says, but recruiting activists from all over the country, of having prominent politicians who are from rural areas, of making clear that you know, of, you know, going around the country and actually listening rather than just giving yet another canned campaign speech. And that's you know, a long, hard slog. It means building organizations. It means recruiting activists. It means articulating sort of a new vision of responsiveness and accountability. But I think without that, this is where we are. We're going to be stuck with sort of, you know, either populism or you know, Tina. There is no alternative style politics. Um, but again, these are not easy asks um, by any means. Thank you. So we ha I have once again, Mr. Robert Caprich, uh, you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm sitting here in a dark room or so. <laughs> that has something to do that I'm sitting in Eastern Germany, <laughs> another country of transformation with a very high, um, with a uh, uh, voters share in, in uh, populist and right wing uh, politics. Uh, people who do not believe very much in a liberal democracy. Therefore, it's a little bit dark here. Uh, I think the question of an alternative is rather clear to me, although I have to admit that for each country you must have a specific plan or an alternative. But there is one common thing in all that what we can observe. I found that there is a very strong correlation between the type of economic transformation and the erosion of democracy. This transformation deepens the split between rural regions and urban regions, between rich and poorer people. And that is a main problem that lead, leads people to vote for right-wing and populist parties. And the lesson we can learn from that was Mr. Kaczynski and the PIS is doing is nothing what has to do with populist or uh, right-wing policies. They simply found support for the right-wing policy by a social program, which should be, in my view, the program of social democrats. But they never did that. And the alternative is, and to find support for a democracy in Poland and in all the other countries too, is simply to couple a program of democracy 
defense of the de democratic structures to combine it with a social program that is able to uh, overcome this split in the in the society. Well, you know, I, I couldn't agree more, but I would also say that the devil's in the details, right? And <laughs> how do you come up with a new set of social policies that both address inequality and are sustainable over the long run without hurting growth, uh, hurting FDI, et cetera, et cetera? Um, that's, you know, the million dollar question. And I, I, if you have more of an answer that I would, I would love for, uh, to read that. But I do think that, you know, I mean, it's, it's, yes, it's both, a, it's both, I think, a very clear cut solution and one that I think in practice would be extremely difficult to achieve once sort of, you know, we get down into the details of what happens and to whom and under what circumstances. So um, I'm, oh, I, I'm still welcoming questions, but I'm very happy that there is a temporary break and I, have, I, I can ask my second question, uh, which draws the many things that have been said before. And I actually wanted to, quote an article of a person who actually is with us in the audience and I will now commit a linguistic spelling crime because I don't know how to pronounce the name of uh, Saigun Gora Kisel. I'm very sorry for mispronouncing your name. I read with students rest recently an article he wrote for Dialectical Anthropology in which he was uh, he provides fascinating account from the Kuron Festival in Warsaw. This is a festival organized by the Kritika Politischna Milieu and Kuron Festival would suggest that there will be celebration of uh, socialist ideas. However, one of the guests invited was Jeffrey Sachs, who after listening to a lot of comments uh, from young Polish people who were saying unemployment, problems, inequalities, wanted basically to shut them down. And at a certain point, he said, you have to be happy with what, with what you said. You are a normal country now. We won't come to save you again. And finally, he said, you have no right to utopia. And this was a sentence that my students and I, we were like really discussing for a long time. And I wanted to use this, this quote and encourage all of you to read that great article by Saigun or Saigun, I'm very sorry again. And to ask you related to the question, to the previous question, when you mentioned different strategies that these new parties today should undertake, right? That they should go to the people, go to the countryside, uh, um, you find new politicians also who know how to speak to the people and know problems on the ground. So there is problem on the strategies on the one hand, but on the content of the other, to what extent there is place for some kind of utopia, this is my question, and to what extent the problem is not only the strategies that we pay so much attention to, but the content. And one of the specific issues I wanted to address is the civic nationalism that you emphasized. Because this is something where many people object, where they say they cannot be inclusive nationalists. There is no space for nationalism. While I think coming up with some project of progressive inclusive nationalism is the task that seems to me the most prominent now in the moment when we see that the class identities are not a glue. The nationalism is the only glue for many um, context around the world. And that's why populists manage to hijack it and use it for their purposes. So if you could say a bit more about the content as alternative, not only the strategies and perhaps develop more what you already said on civic nationalism. Um, so to me, you know, I think the anti-corruption and the civic nationalism would be part of the content, right? I think, you know, as, as uh, Hubert pointed out, it is difficult, you know, it's there are obvious social policies that can also sort of you know, reassure people and let them know that they are in fact being listened to and they're in fact being taken care of and they're not just being patronized. But I think the broader project has to be of redefining the nation as based on principles and inclusivity rather than traditions and exclusion. Um, and I think that you know, the efforts of parties to go after corruption are entirely understandable. I just wish they would you know, be able to stick to them. Um, again, I mean, as, as Tim and Kevin demonstrated in their, in their you know, fantastic new book, this is a, an issue that keeps coming up and then you know, party after party brings it up to absolutely no effect, right? And so the question is how do we translate it into actual policy? Um, and I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure if uh, we ought to work towards utopia, but isn't the whole point of politics to work towards something better? Um, so, you know, I think Jeff Sachs may have been particularly crabby that day, because it seems to me that it you know, defeats the whole purpose of being at um, that kind of a festival. Yeah, and actually challenges actually many other things he said in other contexts when it comes to fighting poverty and so on. But uh, yeah, well, thank you for elaborating on the content issue. And I have now on the list, uh, um, Rakesh 
uh, Butterbell, um, please. Um, um. Uh, thank you. Am I audible? Yeah. Uh, thank you. It's, it was a brilliant exposition and I, I learned so much. In, in fact, coming from India, yeah, I think you have to accept advisory role for India too, because the university that I'm in, uh, there are false cases against me too. So we are under tremendous attack. So it's almost the same. You are right. Now, um, uh, a question that uh, Thuk Lin asked about historicizing the elite has troubled me also being familiar with the Romanian and Pol Polish cases more uh, through my long interaction. I always found it quite, um, quite problematic when the elephant in the room is not discussed in, in terms of elite consensus and you know, other, other kind of popular mobilization, understanding of European Union and their reaction to it. And the elephant be, being Russia. And hmm. that Russia, particularly post 97, when you know, post Yeltsin and the devaluation and the entire crisis when the Russian state comes back to its a kind of form that it is today, the Putin's Russia. Since, since you used uh, idiots and Tony Jute and the, <laughs> the entire um, historiographical regime that it has, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Putin, I was wondering as to what does this elite, a large chunk of them actually were product of the system uh, of the 60s and 70s is one. And the new elite, the intellectual, political that we are talking about quite often, may be the product of the 80s and 90s. Now, there must be some disjuncture. Now, that dis disjuncture is never talked about. Now, what is that that one is very curious about? <laughs> and therefore, unless we understand this disjuncture, this, this rupture between two sets of elite or two generations of uh, elite, we are not in, in that sense, uh, we do not have the kind of vantage point or template to, to talk about elite consensus as of today, vis-a-vis -vis against which the populist, uh, populist regime or pop populist uh, mobilization grow, grows up. It is in this context that I still remember or understand the previous generation of elite, including, you know, people like, you know, uh, what uh, Philip Tor talks about in his book about solidarities across intersectionalities that still has. So wh what does it, what does it do to uh, understand this consensus? Are there two consensus that once 80s, they, can, they, they came together and had some kind of an understanding of going to the Western liberal democracy? And this new elite, the new youth, the new millennial generation that is coming up, they have a different motion where Russia is also present in a big shape uh, as a much more robust uh, country today or state today, I won't say country, state today than it was in the 90s. Good. Um, so I think you know, the first thing I would say is that Russia has been incredibly salient to anyone living in the region, both before and after communism. I don't think you'll find a single person in the Polish foreign ministry who, no matter what their birth date, um, will have anything other than their attention sort of you know, firmly planted uh, to the neighbor to the east. So I, I think you'll... What I, what I do think you, um, what I think you're pointing to very, very usefully is the fact that you know there are multiple elites here that we're talking about here, right? There isn't just one homogeneous elite. There are multiple people who sort of change, and they change over time. But that kind of change, this is kind of like you know um, Theseus' ship. The elite sort of you know gets rebuilt over time, but it maintains its status in government, in policy making, in edu the educational system, in finance, and so on. Um, I think there's several continuities. There's, for example, sort of, you know, the, um, the worry about um, authoritarianism. There's this sort of commitment to the EU and to liberal democracy. There's a commitment to globalization among this, the mainstream elite that I think is continuous and has been there from, you know, from the 60s onwards. What I think is the big differences occur is the kind of formative experiences, right? The elite that is in power in the early 1990s has no experience of democratic governance. They have all the democratic commitments and none of sort of the competence that it takes, you know, the basic competence to exercise governance. The generation that comes after them, which in many cases is made of the former communists, does have all this sort of you know, managerial competence. Um, but it too, in order to establish its democratic credentials, hews to the policy consensus. Um, and eventually that formula spends itself. And you know, again, it's the return of the sort of you know, the earlier elites, and then it's sort of you know, capped off by the by the populists uh, coming to power.
But the overall pattern seems to be, you know, the, the, the dif big differences are in the kind of governing experience that people have had um, and what, to form, what kind of governing experience formed them. So the generation now that's in power basically came of, sort of political age after EU accession. To them, the EU is an institution that can be challenged rather than just, you know, complied with. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's, it's not so much the questions of, sort of you know, elite commitments that have changed as much as elite experiences. And each new generation basically received a very different kind of governing experience from you know, being only in the opposition to basically being a mainstay of EU politics. Thank you. We've got now another typed Thank question you. from, uh, yeah, is the, uh, did you want to add something? Um, no. No, it's okay. Okay, thank you. So we have a question from Mr. Tom Miller. So uh, my internet is a little unstable. I've typed the question. In Western countries, we're radicalizing right-wing parties via old parties under FPTP, example, for example, British Conservatives of American Republicans, or new parties under proportional representation, such as Liga in Italy or AFD in Germany. There is also a left-wing counter movement, for example, Corbyn or Sanders, and probably German Greens and Five Star movements in Italy. Why are there no attempts of similar effectiveness or support in Eastern Europe, in your view? Mm -hmm. um, I think the attempts are there, they just don't succeed, right? And so you have sort of, you know, um, there's, for example, a um, extremely sort of secular, very liberal politician in Poland who, you know, kind of, these, these guys basically kind of are like, like, you know, they're like comets, they kind of shine brightly for a few weeks and then they disappear. So it's not that I think there haven't been attempts. Um, I think in general, though, when you look at public opinion polls, these are more conservative electorates, right? So they simply don't have um, the same desire to engage with left anti-politics of the kind that you know, Corbyn represents. You won't find you know, you know, the kind of uh, retro language and rhetoric that Corbyn employs, for example, or that Sanders uses vis-a-vis -vis young people just isn't legible, um, I think, in a country where you've just spent, you know, the last 30 years attempting to get away from these kind of old fashioned, you know, notions of the left as basically uh, a bunch of comrades working to plan the economy. It's just not, you know, it's, there isn't that much of an attraction. And that's not to say that these efforts aren't made. There are sort of, you know, left politicians who come and go all the time. They just don't find my, uh, much traction. And I'm not sure exactly what, you know, it would take for them to actually get that. Thank you. I think this was a <laughs> uh, question that we uh, that, that 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 we got. I'm sorry. I was just checking the chat to make sure that I did not miss uh, anyone. That everyone had a chance to um, to ask questions. So I think uh, we can uh, we can close now. And thank you, Anna, once again for a fantastic talk. And thank you all. I think it was a really great discussion with lots of points of views, different generations, experiences, also disciplines. So. Um, I guess we can wish uh, good afternoon to everyone on the West Coast, to good evening to everyone on the East Coast, and uh, good night to everyone in Europe or India.